Yeah, many, many congratulations to CBPS and the young team of scholars for, the, for today's event and for the celebration. Uh, you know, after the rich morning session, uh, you asked me to speak, and I don't know where to begin, uh, but I think uh, I, we all of us enjoyed uh, what was told to us. It resonated with so much of our feelings and what we are anxious about uh, India's democracy and India's future. So it, uh, and sometimes it left us with hope, sometimes it left us with despondence, sometimes with depression, as some have stated. You know, but we must remember that our freedom was a hard-won freedom from colonial regime. And often, we have never called our country's freedom movement a revolutionary movement. I think it's time that we start talking about it as India's revolution. We talk about Chinese revolution, we talk about Russian revolution, we talk about French revolution, we talk about American revolution. We have never talked about India's revolutionary movement and the transformation of India from a colonial regime to an independent regime through a mass nonviolent struggle based on you know the leaders of all hues who got us this country and this country's constitution. Again, we were told that our constitution, even I learned history like that, that we borrowed from all countries to make our delightful constitution. We were never told that the constitution was a product of freedom movement. Millions of mutinies and struggles of tribals, of Dalit, of middle class, of social reformers, of revolutionaries, and with so many participating it. What kind of history were we taught? In my generation, I was not taught. So what did we hand over to the current generation on what India meant? That India meant secularism. India meant freedom of speech. India meant civil liberties. India meant union of states. India meant its people. Nothing, nothing was taught to not just me, but my next generation and their next, uh, next generation. As Aruna said, we failed. Our generation failed in creating an imagination of India and an Indian nation as a secular nation, and there we should be proud about it. It's time, at least now, we recall the pride in India, India's constitution as a great uh, product of a great, uh, I mean, history. So this is the first thing I would like to sort of highlight. The second thing I would like to highlight is the context of independence and autonomy that we are talking about. Soon after independence, Indian state was branded by the leftists as a stooge, continued to be a stooge of imperialism, continued to be a stooge of capitalism. And there were some socialists who called ye azadi jhoot hai. No, we were products of such a democracy that we allowed all this kind of analysis being made about India, but we never looked at the independence of the state, its autonomy in nation building of India. We were not students of any class. Nehru and his team and the freedom fighters looked at Indian state as relatively autonomous of any specific class. And they looked at the freedom that we had to have had to be all class freedom for all in the values of equality, in the values of social justice, in the values of freedom and fraternity that my friends have just talked about. And they were, when we are talking about independent human rights institutions, independent organizations that all of us have built, I must tell you, India was also built on independence of any specific class. It tried to be inclusive of all classes. Of course, there were contestations. Of course, there was contestations between the farmers and the capitalists. There was contestation between the middle class and others. But then it looked at a long-term perspective of what India has to be. And that is how I think we built our nation. But we never looked at the relative, the contestations that they had to overcome in building the institutions Professor Varghese had talked about. You know, now we are going through something called data terrorism, I would think. There they were developing institutions for, I was really enlightened by, you know, the statistics of the economic data that they produced. They were so autonomous. Why? Because the state was autonomous. 
So here, I think uh, Shah Menon did talk about you mimic from where you come from. Azim Premji University mimicked the NGO sector. We mimicked the state as NGOs because we thought the state comes in multiple avatars, but we picked up that avatar of the state which stood for social justice. Of course, there was a repressive state apparatus. Of course, there was police. Of course, there were movements where there was torture. But many of us who worked, who engaged with the state, took up that aspect of the state which thought it could be independent, autonomous, it could stand for democratic values, it could stand for equality. That gave us all, which Aruna said, the hope that you could access the state at all levels. So somewhere we cannot black, black face the state as one repressive apparatus. It's, it's a hegemonic rule. And that hegemonization came in the framework of liberal democratic framework. And now there is an alternate hegemony. I think that is becoming hegemonization of the Hindu Rashtra. That kind of a hegemony cannot accommodate the constitutional values that we are talking about. It, it's, it's contrary, it's an oxymoron to have an, a Hindu Rashtra and a constitutional uh, document that we have swearing by. But who on earth taught our youth that this is a great document? That is why I think we are all talking about, let us propagate the idea of the, doc, of the Constitution everywhere. Again, that is why it cannot come from the top. We have, I'm sorry to say, a bankrupt elite. India never had an enlightened elite. There was never elite consensus on democracy. There was never an elite consensus on education as public good. Never an el elite consensus on health as a public good. Never an elite consensus on removal of caste discrimination. These were not issues that they thought they should first grapple with. Somewhere our elite was a huge compromising elite. I'm sorry to say that I have no evidence. If you ask me to give me evidence, I am no researcher. Nowadays, for everything you say, you have to give evidence. I don't want to give evidence. I speak from my heart, from my experience. I find the communities, you trust them. They are willing to change reality. They are willing to fly. They develop wings. But the elite is not able to even catch them or even understand them. What kind of an elite do we have? That vacuum, I think, is the peril of what we are facing today. Communities are ready. They understand secularism. They live secular lives. They cannot but live secular lives. It's, it's, it's impossible for them to be communal. In fact, because they are what they are, we won our little, little struggles in our village work, in, in the NGO sector that we know. If they were communal, we couldn't have brought them all together. You know, so believe in the community, and their capacities to, and they need the constitution more than any one of us sitting here. I mean, the people who now swear by the constitution are the weakest, the poorest, the Dalit, the Muslims, the minorities, not you and me. We don't need it because we got whatever we wanted from the constitution. My education was subsidized. I, had, I went to a school where I paid six rupees a month. I went to Usmania University where I paid 13 rupees a month for my MA. I went to JNU where I paid some, I think, 66 rupees a month. I was a product of subsidized electricity, subsidized gas, subsidized train tra travel. Everything in my life was subsidized. And today when the poor want subsidy, what do we tell them? These kinds of what? There's some Hindi word for it. Devdi. 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 What rubbish? We are products of Devdi. You're all sitting here as products of Devdi. And for them, you don't want to give? What is this democracy about? If democracy is not about equality, then what is democracy about? If democracy is not about social justice, what is democracy about? And I, I'm sorry I'm rambling because I have to do the last speech, no? <laughs> but I think we will have to, see, we have forgotten what democracy is about. If there is no equality, there is no justice, there is no social justice, there are no rights, there is no democracy. 
democracy is not electoral politics alone. I'm not saying it's not electoral politics. But today, our sites of contestation cannot be elections. Because you know whom you vote can easily be bought over. It's become such a farce. Our sites of contestation has to be popular movements, has to be, again, get back to people, get back to community, get back to the youth, get back to telling them what our country is about, get, go to the Dalit, go to the Adivasi, go, get energy from them. You know, you go empty-handed, Aruna knows that better, many of you are working with the people, you go uh, better. I, I miss the smell of cow dung and beedi. After some time, I want to go back to the village, get energy to be able to say there is hope and we can do better. Do that. Go to the, uh, you know, every slab that people are struggling for, everyday survival with such dignity. Take strength from them, take shakti from them, take energy from them, and you can fight. That is, I like the word Aruna ended, saying fight. Hope is power. Hope is energy. Don't give up. And let's all raise to the occasion and say this, this blessed government will go, must go. And that's how I would like to end uh, today. Thank you.